Um, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start our session today. Um, the title of our session is called, Is Video Making It a Small World? And the small stands for Smart Mobile Assisted Language Learning. Um, we have four presenters today in this session. My name is Susie Lee. I'm from Georgia Tech Language Institute. And I work there as an instructional designer and a lecturer. And in the past few years, my focus has been on making MOOCs and other asynchronous online courses. I'll let Rodrigo introduce himself next. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Carvalho. I am originally from Brazil, but I work at Georgia Tech. Um, my work is mostly at the IEP there. I teach mostly grammar and writing, but I also design online courses and do a lot of work with uh, video games and MOOCs. Hi there. Uh, my name is James May. I'm the Faculty Fellow for Innovation and Technology at Valencia College in Orlando, Florida, where I also teach EAP um, and have for about uh, 18 years now. <laughs> so. And my name's Tony Urban. I'm Chair of Education at the University of Tampa, and I work with pre-service teachers uh, in doing a whole bunch with augmented reality and virtual reality, and then using that stuff to use with their students in schools. Okay, so we're going to start our session. Um, I've never presented in this space before, so usually I worry about being too short that you guys can't see me, but now I actually feel like I, I'm naked. I mean, this is like really exposed. Um, if you have problems, um, I don't think you'll have a problem hearing me, um, but if you have any questions or any issues while you're listening to the presentation, just raise your hand and we can address it right away. Okay, so my part is going to be focused on videos in MOOCs. And in the MOOC world, um, more and more students are relying on their smartphones or mobile devices to take the courses. And so when you are thinking about the videos that you see in those MOOCs, and as a designer for those videos, there are a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. So I just want to go over the numbers for MOOCs. Um, are you guys familiar with MOOCs at all? Are any of you enrolled in any MOOCs? Can you raise your hand? OK, cool. Have any of you made a MOOC before? OK, oh, OK. One or two people. Awesome, awesome. So um, as of the records showing today, um, in 2016 and 2017, MOOCs really had a very high enrollment at 23 million new users added per year. So that's a really a great amount of people um, using this type of service to get some education. The three platforms that Georgia Tech is associated with is Coursera, edX, and Udacity. And the numbers for each of those platforms are pretty high as well. Uh, the five courses that we have on Coursera that are focused on business English have over 300,000 learn 300, learners enrolled um, in the past two years. So again, you're really, really, you're really dealing with a wide audience, a great range of different types of people from different parts of the world joining in in your course to learn English. Now in the MOOC world, when you subscribe or apply as a learner, you run into two options. There are the free courses and then there are the paid courses. And the free courses, there are a, a great range of really interesting free courses out there. Uh, but once you get into the paid world, you notice that the quality of the content and especially the quality of the videos are gonna be quite different. And so depending on how you want to approach MOOCs as a developer, you need to take that into consideration as well. So the videos in the MOOCs are really important because they take up about 70 to 90% of the course content. This is really where all of the important information is gonna ha be housed and be delivered. And so you need to be very thoughtful in how you put together your videos um, and the videos are important in another way because they're a great way for your learners to build rapport with the instructor that they see on the screen and with the topic and also provide um, a very seamless virtual experience for them. 
Videos can also be great motivators for the learning experience and stimulate the whole process itself. And so the better your videos are, the more likely the students are gonna stay with the course and complete the course and become successful uh, learners. So this is just a snapshot from one of our courses. And as you can see, on a phone, uh, the video becomes very small, literally small. And on this particular screen, I've used fonts that are about 32 points to about 46 points. But they still look rather small. And these days, the issue with mobile devices is that with Coursera and edX, They've added a lot of features that can be found only in a mobile app that they don't have in the regular uh, browser-based um, course, and that is the transcript function, but also this save a note function. This save a note function is really great. What it does is it timestamps the location where you press it. Uh, students get this little pop-up where they type in notes or record notes or even doodle notes uh, that they want to um, retain. And then once they go back to the video to review, the notes stay there and it, it pauses whenever you save that note. Uh, but the issue it, with uh, the video is it becomes this small. And so the size that I had earlier, the 32 to 46, becomes a lot smaller on the screen. And so those kind of things need to be uh, under consideration whenever you decide to add some text or images to your videos. So I'm going to go over five tips um, based on my experience as an instructional designer developing the courses. And if any of you have been to my previous presentations, like some of this is going to sound like a broken record, so I apologize for that. Um, but I, I want to repeat them because these are the guidelines that we still follow in all of our course design when it comes to asynchronous online courses. Um, and again, depending on your audience, you can choose to uh, go a different route, but especially for uh, an audience like the MOOC audience where you have thousands and thousands of people taking the course at the same time with really no actual interaction with the instructor, a lot of these tips will um, take your videos far. So tip number one is to keep your video short. So what do I mean by short? Um, according to some of the research that's been done with video streaming and with MOOCs, uh, it looks like at around the six minute point, people drop out. So basically they lose interest and they either don't watch the rest of the video or they just stop and decide not to come back to it. And the research on the right side is from 2014. Um, based on stream, streaming videos, but the research on the left side is actually from edX courses. And they found that once you hit that six minute mark, it's really when you lose your students. And so I recommend that you keep your videos at a relative uh, short length of four to six minutes long. Now, does this mean that all of your lessons have to be within six minutes? No. Your lessons could be longer, but the videos need to be chopped up into these smaller segments so that it helps the students digest it a little bit better, it gives them an opportunity to pause um, and just refresh before they start in the, on the next video. So in our MOOCs, we have some lessons that are divided up into two, three videos. Some lessons are still just the one video with the six minutes, uh, but on average, all of our videos are about 5.57 minutes long. The second tip I have for video creation is to have somebody be in the videos. And this could actually be a person, like you see on the screenshots here, um, or it could even be your hand. Uh, we've noticed that with a lot of the Udacity videos that we created with them, um, even just having the instructor draw something or point to something or circle something with their finger was much more effective than just having a PowerPoint slide with a circle going around it. And so having that physical presence in the video really helps the learner engage a little bit better. And our recommendation is to be in the video 30 to 40 percent of the time. Also, if you're going to be in the video with your face or whoever is going to be in the video, it's really great if you can get them to bring out their charisma and personality. So a lot of the instructors that we have that we showcase in our uh, 
in our videos, they are amazing face-to-face -face teachers. And it's hard for them to transfer that straight to the camera right away, but with a little bit of practice and a little bit of encouragement, you can bring that out. And that really, really helps uh, create that human side to that video and not just a talking head. And lastly, this is probably the hardest, to be honest. When you are in front of the camera, it's really hard to smile. Like even right now while I'm presenting, there's a camera right there, and I'm trying really hard to consciously smile, but it's very hard. It almost feels like you're like stretching your lips and you know, grinding your teeth. Um, but smiling in a video makes a huge difference. It's also really important to smile if you're just doing a narration. So with audio recordings, and you can test this out for yourself, but if you do an audio recording where you're smiling and you do one without smiling, the audio quality and just the, the way the message comes across is very different. So definitely get those uh, teeth showing. Um, so the previous slide I had Jerry, this is Jerry by the way, I had Jerry, um, you know, kind of in that standard lecture mode with some text on the side of him. But in a lot of other scenes, I actually have him working in a very comfortable workspace. So the course that Jerry is showcased in is, uh, is about professional email writing. So a lot of times I have him sitting at his desk, you know, drinking some coffee, writing an email, and then talking to the student as if you're doing a one-on-one -on -one in the office together with them. So it really adds that personal touch to the learning experience, especially for the MOOC learners who are millions of miles away from us. Uh, another way you could add more personality is to bring in some humor. So this is Jerry with a wig, and the reason why this happened was, you know, he was talking about how important it is to know uh, who you are emailing before you actually email them. And he said that so many times students assume that he's a woman and will call him Mrs. Landers. And so I couldn't help but give him a wig for this particular scene where he is now Mrs. Landers. So again, you know, just have fun with the videos. They don't have to look all polished and professional. You know, bringing in these elements really gives it that personality. A third tip is to be mindful of font size. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, so I'll go into it a little bit deeper now. So these are the different font sizes. And again, like I try to use a range in between here but you always wanna test it out with the actual mobile devices your students are gonna be using. So if you know they have tablets that are larger than most smartphones, then you could go with that size. But if you know that they only use smartphones, you know, you need to reconsider how those fonts are gonna show up on their screen. So really do a test of that um, before deciding on the actual font size for your text. The fourth and fifth are both gonna be about making your videos more engaging. And really the first way, aside from making them short, having the personality, being in the videos, is to make your scenes a little bit short. So what that means is, if I had Jerry in that office, no matter how nice his wig looks or his you know, natural style of talking is, if he's doing the same thing for the whole four to six minutes, it is not an interesting video at all. And so making some change in that video, something can pop up, maybe like a, a text pops up, maybe a little avatar pops up, maybe even a speech bubble pops up next to him, or the scene changes altogether. But having that change every 20 to 30 seconds is recommended to keep that engagement going. And you know, as the instructor is teaching, you want that person to frequently check for comprehension. So even things like, are you following the lesson? You know, what were the three things we just talked about? Just giving them those cues to think about what they're learning and to be more attentive to what the instructor is saying is, is very important for keeping that in engagement going. And lastly, another way you could do this, and this is a little more technical, uh, but you can add in video prompts. And an in video prompt looks something like this. Um, so in this video, I am actually in the video. Um, and I was talking about using mobile devices. So I wanted to do a poll with the, with the learners that I had. And so I had this pop up. As soon as I asked, what kind of mobile device do you use? Uh, the prompt comes up and they're able to choose and they see the poll right away and can see you know, what their classmates are using. Um, there are various services that provide this kind of in-video prompt. Uh, one of the ones that I like to use, especially if you have a lot of YouTube videos, is Happyak. Um, it, it has a free version of their service and there's also a paid. Um, 
But if you have other services, like if your school has um, Kaltura or other vi video solutions, a lot of them come with these in-video services as well to add to the videos. The fifth one is to add animation. And this might be a little bit harder for some of you, but a lot of the software that's out there is pretty much the same as how PowerPoint works. So if you can create uh, graphs and images on a PowerPoint slide, you can create animation pretty easily. Um, just to show you a comparison, so this is from a MOOC course that we had on speaking professionally. And you know, on one side we have a scene where I have bullet points for ways to disagree, and on the other one, um, we have ways to get your turn, but in this one I decided rather than showing another bullet point to have these animated avatars kind of say how to get their turn. So we have this one guy saying, sorry to interrupt, and I actually have voiceovers uh, on the animation as well. And so just mixing it up a little bit here and there really gets um, your videos you know, up that level. The three software that I would like to recommend for doing this is Movely, Powtoon, and Go Anime. They're really popular now. I think you know the first time I showcased these um, at the EV fair was a couple of years ago, and nobody had heard about them. But I think a lot of you may have seen at least one of these uh, um, through an ad or, or actually used it. Uh, this particular one that I showcased here is um, done with Powtoon, but all three of them have really easy to use uh, interfaces, and if you're familiar with a little bit of video editing, they are very simple to use. And again, a lot of them are like creating an animated PowerPoint slide. One last software I want to introduce is VideoScribe. Um, if you're familiar with Udacity courses or even some TEDx videos and the way the Khan Academy uh, likes to use some of their uh, videos in that pen written style, there is software out there that you could use to create the same look and feel. Uh, Videoscribe is really great because it has a huge library of images, fonts, and different texts that you could pull in. Again, just like a PowerPoint slide, you just kind of pull it in, press play, they start writing it out and drawing it out for you, so it's really awesome. And if you have any familiarity with Illustrator or creating vector files, uh, if you move your vector files into Videoscribe, they will draw those out for you as well. So again, a really great software um, for educators to put into their videos, just to add that level of interest. So to review the tips that I just gave you, you want to keep your videos short, you know, four to six minutes long. Uh, try to have somebody, if you don't want to be in the videos, you know, get somebody that has some charisma to be in the videos for you, but about 30 to 40 percent of the time, if somebody is in there, even a little finger or a hand, um, it just makes a world of a difference. And also, especially with the small devices, uh, you want to be mindful of the font size. And um, lastly, to make your videos more engaging, you could add um, in-video pop-ups or animation, or even the, the instructor just trying to get uh, their engagement heightened by asking for comprehension. All of those ways are really great ways to create great videos for MOOCs or online courses. So thank you. Um, we're going to have three more people present, but I'm just going to have a really short Q&A time for any of the things that I just talked about here. If you have questions that are directed to me, you could raise your hand. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Susie. I had a question about how much do you plan before um, creating the video and what happens in post-processing? So in terms of specifically the content and what the instructor is doing and, and then you know, adding animation and other things. Yes, so that's, a a bit yes that. that's a really good question. So you know, I didn't really want to get into the nitty gritty of how this actually comes about. So there's a lot of pre-production uh, that you'll need to go through, especially for videos that you want to showcase in MOOCs. And so that would involve storyboarding um, and scripting and, and all of that. And just to give you an idea of how much time it takes, to create one minute of video, it takes me approximately 24 hours. So the 24 hours includes the planning, the writing, you know, the filming, the editing, adding animation if possible. Um, and so that's why, you know, even keeping your videos short, the four to six minutes, it's great on your part because imagine creating 12 minutes of video, putting all that work in, 
you know, 24 hours per minute, and then the students stop watching at six minutes. I mean, that would be a nightmare for me. I'd be like, oh, like all that time I put into the other six minutes, you guys missed that. Um, so again, even for you as developers, keeping it short really makes it more feasible to do. Um, I've tried to find ways to streamline some of this process, but it still is a lot more work. And uh, one thing I did notice, though, is you know the, the Jerry video with the wig, that was one of the first videos I created. This was back in 2015. And the videos I create right now are much more polished, but because I don't put that much time into the pre-production anymore, they're not as interesting. They don't really have that humanistic factor that some of my earlier videos had. So although the earlier ones looked a little more homemade, I put so much work into the planning part. And again, the more you put into the planning part, you really see the results in the actual production part. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you so much. Can you talk a little bit about your process of collaborating with instructors to create the content that will be in that four to six minutes of video? Yes. Um, so, you know, before we even dive into the scripting and all of that, we have to be in an agreement. So, um, because I'm a teacher as well as an instructional designer, it was a lot easier for me to um, know what the instructor wanted to do and point out ways to do it a little bit better because I'm familiar with the topic. Um, but, you know, to be honest, it's really hard. I mean, last year, Rodrigo and I presented and the title was Our First MOOCs Lessons Learned. And we did a whole segment on that, the dynamics of the people that get involved. I mean, they're, um, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And so you need the team to really work together. Um, and again, everybody needs to be okay with redos. Like there were, there were a couple of courses where we filmed and produced and did everything up till module three, and then we had to just trash everything and start all over again. And so things like that happen. And again, it could have been because we didn't plan enough, um, but it, it could also mean that along the way you realize this isn't the course the learners want. Um, so yes. But there were at least about um, seven to eight people working on these courses for a period of about six months. Um, I was in another session where they said something similar, but you need a group. It, it, it can't be something that you do alone, um, and you need a lot of good communication and collaboration. So, you know, extra hours is a given. Um, you know, high tension situations is a given, but yes, it's, I can definitely, tell you more after the session if you if you're interested okay thank you I'm gonna I'm gonna let the next person talk and if you guys have questions for me I'll, I'll, I'll accept them at the end thank you Hello, everybody. Uh, like Susie said, uh, I'm also from Georgia Tech. We actually work together in several projects. Uh, but today I want to talk a little bit more about video games and uh, language learning apps. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to show a little bit about my, uh, the presentation because uh, this presentation was a little bit of a challenge for me. My, most of my work is done with uh, video games. and. Uh, I'm not very well versed in mall, but uh, you know this was a journey that was kind of interesting, and in the end, it was I think it turned out to be pretty good. Uh, in the beginning, I'm going to talk to you about my background uh, with call mostly. Uh, then I'm going to try to talk about the role of video in language apps. Uh, this is nothing like really based on really formal re research, but. It was my, my experience trying to jump in from the small world to the small world, and I think I came up with a few, uh, a few interesting ways to separate and to analyze the different ways of using video in, uh, in those environments. Uh, I'm also going to talk about video games in, in mobile uh, devices because that's, that's basically what I do. Um, and you know, always trying to highlight pedagogical applications and finally trying to answer this very good question of uh, is video making uh, making in a small world because I thought it was a great title for the presentation too and uh, very thoughtful and it, it gave me a lot to think about too. Uh, 
So anyway, this is uh, my background. Uh, my background is with Call. I started uh, with the League of Legends based course. It's a video game I designed for our IEP. We have a special purposes track. So uh, I wanted to do something different and unique. And since I played a lot of video games, I thought it was a good chance to try to you know, adventure into something completely new. And as I did that, I came across a lot of video. Uh, and video was actually a very big part of video games. Uh, I mean, given the name, not a surprise, but uh, a lot of cinematics, a lot of film, a lot of uh, illustration. So I ended up uh, uh, you know, making that connection through my uh, early experience with the uh, League of Legends course. Then after that, I moved on to create this uh, video game based courses online. Uh, basically, I tried to move some of what I had done and got some of the principles of what, of it, what I had done with the League of Legends course and tra transferred it to an online platform uh, for teacher training, basically. Uh, basically, just trying to get teachers to think about using video games as uh, materials, as, uh, you know, th there's many ways to do it, but uh, just, I guess, trying to get teachers to be comfortable using video games uh, in their classes uh, for language learning. Uh, so yeah, I did two. I did one with um, one with uh, more for like brow browser-based games, uh, which is actually on right now, and another one that's more theoretical for more complex games. And finally, I worked a little bit in MOOC projects too. Uh, the examples that Susie actually talked about with the, you know, with Jerry, with the wig. You know, I was also involved a little bit in that one too. Uh, but yeah, that's basically my background. So that will have an impact on how I'm going to show you the role of video here in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in mobile devices. <clears throat> so first, I'm going to talk about language learning apps. I thought this was an interesting thing because it was similar to what my experience was related to my experience uh, designing uh, gaming courses. Because the way we approach video, there are like some there are some commonalities. So I felt like, well, I'm going to try talking about language learning apps because they use so much video too, a lot like games. Um, I divided them in three groups. The first group I divide, I called it the multi skills apps. Um, these apps are like ABA. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Innovative, fluent, new. Uh, these apps are heavily dependent on video, and they they also like try to bring several skills at once. Uh, for language learning, so they use reading, writing, grammar, um, you know, several different types, and they all use videos in different ways. I'm going to talk to you uh, more detail a little bit uh, in, in a second. Uh, there's also apps, there are language learning apps that are skill specific, like they target only speaking or only listening or only uh, grammar, and they do not use a whole lot of videos. Sometimes they have videos, sometimes they don't. A lot of them rely on um, uh, slides or small bits of animation. Uh, and some examples are Speaking Paul. Speak Paul actually has some video, uh, Hello Talk, Billing Web, uh, a bunch of them. Uh, All Ears English is a podcast, basically, so there's basically no video. Uh, but skill specific, in general, apps tend to use very little video. Uh, the other type of app that I kind of came up with too was, uh, I call them interactive apps. This is more like Memrise, Easy Peasy, Rosetta Stone. In the early levels especially, not a whole lot of video going. Sometimes when you get up in the upper levels, you, you see more video, uh, but uh, also not very uh, video heavy. Um, uh, let's see if I can go next. Looks like, did it freeze? Yeah, looks like we froze. So, um, for these kinds of apps, video had a very specific function. Mostly, they served as materials. Uh, most of the lessons were based on a small film dialogue that took place right in the beginning of the course, and all the follow-up activities were based on that video lesson. A lot of it was actually film. Um, they lasted uh, one to five minutes on average. There was a lot of acting or semi-acting or semi-professional acting. Uh, if you look very critically, sometimes actually funny <laughs> uh, acting. But uh, uh, yeah, this seemed to be a pattern for that kind of app. Uh, and 
very importantly, pedagogically speaking, uh, the role of them was really create context so that you could develop other activities after that. Um, sometimes you found some apps with uh, full video classes like Great uh, Courses Plus, which is not really like a language learning app. It's a general uh, learning app, but they have language courses at that, with that app too. Um, uh, some uh, apps like uh, Fluent U, for example, have 15-minute uh, videos, 5-minute videos, innovate especially around 15 minutes. Uh, they do the, uh, the, how's it called again, the one-on-one, uh, like for example, if you're learning Japanese, it would be Japanese uh, 101.com or something like that. Excellent question, uh, excellent uh, lessons actually, but also available on YouTube, so not necessarily need to go there. Um, Sometimes the videos are like edited and played back for these kinds of apps and used as excerpts for exercises. So if they need to recap a specific part, specific uh, vocabulary item, for example, they would replay that video and then um, uh, you know to, so to refresh your memory so that you could complete a certain activity. Uh, and those videos are normally like less than a minute because they're re-edited from the main lesson. Um, but definitely worth checking those out, especially ABA. I thought it was very concise and uh, uh, very well well uh, designed. <clears throat> uh, seems like this uh, is not moving. I'm gonna manually move from this app. So this is uh, this is like a screenshot of the acting kind of video that one that lasts like one to five minutes and is in a lot of apps. This is an ABA English. Uh, app and this is like an example of like full lectures the 40 minute ones the 30 minute ones the longer ones tend to be simply full lectures like somebody's sitting over there there's a camera in front of them and they, all they do is talk yeah. it's very different use from many other types of video we've seen um, uh, for the spe uh, skill specific uh, apps uh, and the interactive apps uh, there was not a lot of video some some of them had video but most of them did not have video. Uh, I guess because if you are, for example, focusing on listening or focusing on speaking, uh, you do not necessarily need to have them. You can just like have uh, slides or screenshots or interactive conversations like in a thread kind of format. Uh, and that seemed to be like the, the norm. Uh, a lot of the interactive apps like uh, Memrise uh, the sim had a similar format than uh, Rosetta Stone, for example. They would have to move around with your finger and uh, you know, accomplish small little tasks to develop uh, as you go through the app. Um, this is a screenshot of uh, Bilingual app. Uh, this app is like mostly a reading app. Uh, this is like a French excerpt basically, but uh, you would play it and you'd start reading on it. You'd hear the audio at the same time and you can like click on a certain word to have it pop up and show you the meaning of it and so on. Uh, there, notice there is a play button to it, so it feels like it's a video, but it's not fully a video because really the video is only showing a part of a book with the audio coming across. So it's like a semi-video thing, if you will. Um, uh, this is uh, an excerpt of uh, Hello Talk, which is a speaking mostly app. Uh, you can type in or you can uh, record your messages talking to another peer, basically. Um, now, for games, I found that, you know, basically there are two types of games that uh, use video in a very different way. First is uh, commercial games. Uh, for commercial games, uh, most of the video that's going to appear is as part of the lore of the game that is showing as cinematics. So before, for example, you start playing a game that is let's say a shooting game about Second World War, for example, you'd see the video of the soldiers going to a boat, going through the river, and then finally uh, getting to their destination. That's how video would appear. Um, uh, and in my other presentations, when I talked more about video games, I approach this uh, you know, pedagogically as uh, the same way you would approach like a narrative, for example. So if you're reading a book and there's a narrative with beginning, middle, and end, why not use the cinematics of the video game with the same kind of approach? You can ask your students to retell stories. You can ask students to uh, speak about it. You can ask students to evaluate the narrative of the game and so on. Um, a video appears also as tutorials for commercial games. 
Uh, sometimes it's easier rather than reading instructions to how to play the game, uh, videos pop in and uh, tell you how to do it. Uh, also, sometimes for feedback, after you have completed a certain part of the game, a video will pop out and tell you that, you know, uh, put an end to a story, put an end to a narrative and tell you that you have accomplished it successfully. Um, now, most important of all these video functions for commercial games, uh, in my opinion, is the community fan video. Um, this is a, a phenomenon, like especially for you know the millennial generation. If you play a game, you create uh, fan videos about those games. Um, you basically take a screen uh, recording of you playing the game. Uh, you can put a little side screen of you like talking to your fans or the people who follow you on YouTube about how to play the game, how good the game is, and so on. Um, this is also a great way for you to uh, have your students create content, create videos, talk about their experiences playing the video, creating a community where they can learn how to play the game and do videos at the same time, and then of course using, using language. Um, so for commercial games, that's basically how you'd uh, approach videos on a mall uh, setting. Now there's also like language learning games, and many of these smaller language learning games do not have a whole lot of video. A lot of them have like slides with animations for uh, tutorials, for example, or even for like um, you know giving feedback, or even for lore purposes, they also have. Uh, very short little videos or just the slides. Mobile devices are really strong now and some of the games, for example, as you can see over there, uh, Fortnite and uh, The Sims 2, like they're originally computer games that were transferred to mobile devices and the mobile devices are strong enough to, to hold them nowadays. But for some games that are simpler, they normally don't require that much. Um, they don't require that much input or that much narrative. For example, a game like Scrudos, I don't know if you're familiar with Scrudos, it's basically a word game um, that you play against these little characters and you try to get, spell the word correctly. There's not a, a huge narrative going on, there's very few animations and so on. So not very not as necessary at least. Um, so this is like a shot of uh, The Sims 4 being uh, streamed live from a fan, so it's basically a fan-based video community video. Uh, people make a lot of money doing those things. I think your students are in tune with that, especially if they like the games that they're uh, doing it for. Uh, and uh, Fortnite too, there's also another one there. Those can take a very long time and probably you shouldn't ask them to, to do one hour, 40 minute videos, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll get uh, uh, you know into it. Uh, Atlas Mission and Scrudos, like I said, they're more language learning games, they're simpler games. Uh, Atlas Mission, I chose Atlas sh to show Atlas Mission because it does have a good amount of cinematics, but all in animation format, but it does have a little bit of a lore, so you could even use that if you think your students wouldn't be too interested in more complex games. You could use a game like that, for example, to teach basic vocabulary and to uh, explore the video content of it. Uh, so, is video making it a small world? I think so. I think in many ways, uh, there are so many uses for video in those different types of apps. They appear there everywhere, basically. Uh, of course, some apps, like you saw, use video more than other apps, but all of them can be explored in different ways. Uh, some of the content, some of the apps that are uh, designed for educational purposes, I think, uh, you know, makes it easy because you can use the app itself and the video of the app. But even those who are not, those commercial ones, you can still explore the content of that for language learning. Um, also, like I'm going to repeat that again, creating communities, creating videos, having your students create videos to uh, explore more the game, to address the game in a community setting, to create a YouTube channel, whatever those ways are, I think also worth exploring. Um, uh, the definition of video after I did all this uh, research, uh, it's uh, got a little bit blurred for me because there's so many slides with animations, with sound, and it, it, it changes so much from app to app that it's now difficult for me. I mean, technically, I guess, um, the, you know, if you can stream it, if you can hit a play and step back, that would be a video. But then again, if you just touch it once, 
is that not a video, you know? So there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of development, hap development happening here. And I think in the future, we're probably gonna have uh, even more video content, uh, content on mobile devices since they're getting uh, stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger. That's pretty much it. Uh, if you have any questions, I think there'll be a short Q&A. Yes. Uh, give me one second. It's gonna take the microphone over there. Thank you so much. Very good video. But do do you have anything for math, like math learners, that you can recommend? I mean, I do have mm. some, but anything that you could recommend? I will have to disappoint you with that one because uh, I really do not know a lot about like I, I'm not very knowledgeable about STEM or uh, ESP to that level that I would know a math. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, but uh, I don't know. Anybody here knows? Maybe at the end. Math apps. Are you talking about math apps or in general or math video? Oh, math apps and video. Okay. Uh, well, there's there. I can talk to you offline specifically about a, a handful of math apps that can be used that are free and open source, from smart smart device smart device led math apps that will actually solve problems and help students with problems to training apps to how Khan Academy can be used on the smartphone there's a lot of there's math papa there's there's a there's a ton of apps i can talk to you about offline and so talk to me about that afterwards and i'd be happy to share some ideas on that any other any other questions any other questions no so i guess i'll go ahead and have james uh, take over okay let's see if i can do this All right, I'm uh, hoping this is gonna work. All right, that was two, right? That's taking yours, right? I was three. There we go. Okay, how are we all doing? Good? Can I give you guys a quick quiz? You guys okay with that? Yes? I'm sorry, it's... it's the acoustics are horrible. Can you hear me? Check, check. Is this on? All right. Quick quiz. Yes? I just shot a video a couple of minutes ago. And uh, since we're having a video conversation, how many of you have a smartphone with you in your hands right now? Excellent. Good. So you can all tell me, because I'm, I'm on an international quest to fix this problem. How many of you can tell me what's wrong with this YouTube video? What's wrong with it? Okay, can I have my phone, please? Um, this is just kind of fun. If you ever see a video like this, it's because the videographer was holding the camera like this. Can you show me with your phones, please, how you're supposed to hold a video camera to get the proper resolution on a video performance? Yes, and so if you walk away from here with at least that, that's brilliant. Okay, that changes the game in terms of your videography. Make sure you hold your phone right. This is great for Facebook, but this, if you want it to play on a high-def TV set or a computer screen or something else, hold your phone properly, yes? Do we good? All right, now, um, <laughs> we'll talk about that. You guys know how YouTube does that, right? You guys have all seen these tools. Um, I'm talking a little bit about the apps today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and mirror my device to the computer so you can showcase apps as we're going through this. Can you hear me okay over the mic? I'm pretty loud. Um, so uh, what we're looking at here is my phone. No, oh, not yet. Where are you? There we go. And hopefully the mirroring is going to work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Doesn't look like it's playing nicely today. So maybe I'll stop that for now and I'll talk a little bit out with uh, the videos I have here. YouTube exists on most of our phones. We can all download and install the app. And YouTube, of course, has the feature now to allow you to go live from anywhere. And so if you have the YouTube app, any of your phones can be an immediate YouTube reporter. If you have a YouTube, if you have a Gmail account, how many of you have Gmail accounts? Okay, how many of you have YouTube accounts? Yeah, because your Gmail account is your YouTube account because Google owns YouTube, right? 
And so if you take your phone out and go to YouTube, there's a camera in the top right button. If you click on that, it basically opens up this picture, which is kind of hard to see right now. Let's see if I can make this bigger for you. Can you see this right here where it says record or go live? Those are the two options you have. You can either record or go live or take anything that exists on your phone. I happen to have a video of Jewel here from another conference I was at, but you can make any of that go live to your YouTube account it's free, it's great for uploading, which makes all of us into videographers. Any of us can produce content. And when I present, I get a lot of people who tell me, James, what are the apps that make the best for video productions? And there are some smart apps out there. How many of you are using Adobe Premiere Clip? Who has no idea what Adobe Premiere Clip is yet? Okay, what Adobe Premiere Clip does is it basically is a free app that you can install for your Android or your iOS device, which allows you to just pick videos, pick a soundtrack, and click a button and it'll automatically sync still images and video and soundtrack to the music so that the images change and transition to time. Now you can also go in there and cut it and edit and trim and add fades and effects and do all that. It's free. Uh, Adobe Premiere is a big uh, blockbuster kind of industry standard for cutting and editing video for movies. But Adobe Premiere Clip is something we can all put on our phones. It's a great app. But when I present, a lot of times I want teachers to walk away with the idea that it's not about the app, it's about the application. Can you say that for me, please? Now, what the heck does that mean, right? Well, when we think of apps, we think of the things we install on these phones. But as teachers, we more have to think about how we apply an app to the way we teach. Does that make sense to you? In other words, how are you going to apply an app in the classroom? It's not about whether or not I can record a live broadcast. What assignment am I giving? Are we, doing some, are we doing a segment on the news and we're talking about reporting and, and ethical reporting and maybe ethics and then maybe have students do ethical reports or go out and do roving reports within the schools? You know, how are we going to apply the app is what I'm talking about here. And so it's not about the app, it's about the... You guys with me? Okay, so as we step through here, two apps you can use immediately are YouTube and Adobe Premiere Clip. Everybody should have those just for editing. But it's more about the application. So. Uh, a lot of teachers are wanting differentiation in their K-12 classrooms uh, or in different classes with different language learners. You have learners at different levels. Uh, if you're working on reading, for example, how many of you read to students? How many lower level grades? Uh, how many of you have ever recorded yourself reading to students? Okay. You see, how is it possible for one teacher to be in four different corners of the same room? Well, with smart devices and video, you can read into a video, make sure you hold your camera how again? How do you hold it again? Yeah, okay. Hold your hand here properly, record it properly, and you can actually record yourself reading a book to students, talking about vocabulary, doing whatever you want to work on it linguistically, but then you can put that video in a part of the room so the student hits maybe a scans a QR code, and now you're in that part of the room, while you physically are in a different part of a classroom. That's something that can be done. More importantly, you can actually get people in your school assistant principals, uh, leadership within the school, famous people. You could have guest speakers actually come in and read to your students and use that as extra content. And so it's not really about the video as much as it is what's the application for how you're going to use that video to teach reading, to teach uh, science, maybe labs. You have science labs. Maybe you're working with centers or, or science labs and different parts of the room have different things enabled. Video can be the training on demand right when they get there. Now, how many of you are using QR codes? Who has no idea what I'm talking about right now? It's okay, you don't know? That's okay, you just don't know yet, that's fine. Basically, anything that's on the internet can be turned in with a QR code. I'll show you that real quick. Uh, QR stuff is a website you can go to. And so let's say I made a video like I did a couple minutes ago of you all right here. And if I wanna turn that into a QR code, all I have to do is paste that link here and watch this code. See this code over here? Watch what happens. I grab that YouTube link, I paste it in, and now do you notice how that code changed? If I were to scan that code with my phone, let's see if I can get this to work again. I'll try it one more time. If I scan that code with my phone, my phone is immediately going to go to the, um, let's see if I can get this to go away. It's not liking it today. I'm sorry, I can't screen here today. But what it does is it'll immediately scan it and then my phone will be showing that YouTube video. Now, that's great because if I have books in my classroom, I can make a QR code, print it out, put it on the back of the book, and then my low-level readers, 
if they have a device of some kind, they can scan that and I'm there reading with them. Does that make sense? They don't even need me there, they have me there virtually. If they check out that book and take it home, they have somebody to read to them at night. Yes? And so it's not about the app, it's about how you're going to apply it. You guys with me on that? And so one of the ways that we can do this is with using centers, using differentiated kind of things. Uh, some teachers are using gallery walks. Are anybody, any of you guys using gallery walks with students? We actually have students create content and then you video record them explaining the content or teaching back what they were supposed to learn through their project. You can then put a QR code on that content and then as parents or other people walk through the school and see that content, they can learn not from you, not from the art, well actually from the art itself, but from the student who made that art. And it's kind of a nice productive task where you're mashing up a writing skill with maybe a reading skill, with a research skill, with art, and you can put it all together and actually produce content for students and use it for gallery walks. And so these are applications, but not necessarily apps. With me? All right. I mentioned earlier roving reporters. The YouTube app allows you to go live, which means students anywhere on a campus or anywhere in an area could go live and do a report on something. But what I would like to do is I like to actually tie that to a research project, right? And so you, you put some research together and then you go and you have to do a, a, a one minute spot or a two minute spot on this, kind of like our local news stations do or other people do. And what you're doing is you're getting students to produce content. So they're reading, they're writing, they're speaking. So all language tasks are being pulled together in this one task. And because they know they're going to produce and it's going to go live and be shared with lots of people, they want to make sure that it's the best product possible. So they're coming to you and asking authentic questions. How do I make this work? And it's one of those things that if you haven't done it. Now, another tool, which I think might have been mentioned earlier, but have any, how many of you are using Flipgrid? Flipgrid is another tool for video conference. Uh, it's, again, they may even be here. I don't know, but Flipgrid, again, is what it does is it allows uh, basically students to download an app and you see kind of like a Brady Bunch window, right? And students get uh, about a minute to record a video. It's kind of like Snapchat or other kinds of things, but more of now an academic focus. So you could post a question and instead of having a discussion board online, you could have a video discussion board online. So now instead of working on writing skills, you're working on listening speaking skills where people are talking and answering questions. And what happens is you see all your students' pictures there, you click on it, and now you're watching a video of them talking. And then the next student responds to that video and can interact with that. And so if you haven't seen this, this is Flipgrid. But again, how are you going to use it? Well, we've used traditional discussion boards in online environments for a long time, homework assignments for a long time. This is another way to apply video mobile-based video, because the app is installed on your phone. You just turn on your phone and start talking to it. Most of our students have phones, and so they can turn it on and start talking to the video and actually push that out. And so this, again, is another mobile-based video application. But again, how are you going to apply it? How are you going to use those video discussions? What kind of questions are you going to push? How are you going to have them do the research to, to learn before they present? But Flipgrid is a tool that's there. Now, um, a couple years ago, there was something called uh, FaceSwap. Have you guys all seen this? And what a lot of teachers realized was, why give a presentation, a research presentation on a uh, historical figure or place, right, when I can actually have my students present as a historical figure? In other words, they can look up any image of any person in any time in the world and then wear that person's face in live time. That's what FaceSwap does. It actually allows you, here I'm wearing the Terminator's face. I'm not sure how well you guys can see it. I'll see if I can make it bigger. Um, I'm a sci-fi guy, and so let's see if I can get this bigger for you. Can you guys see that now? Can you see that I'm wearing the Terminator's face? And what happens is, is you can wear any politician's face. You can have politicians from history having academic debates. You can do anything you want. Again, how are you going to apply this? The students wear the face, and instead of giving a speech about a person, you give a speech as a person, which takes a whole new level of learning and, and engagement to get to make part of that. And FaceSwap, again, is an app that you can use it. Now, students will have a common underlying proficiency here, and that a lot of students use Snapchat and other kinds of tools to automatically put bunny ears on themselves and do this. So they're used to looking into the camera to add these, these kind of avatars onto themselves. And so the assignments are pretty easy. There's not a lot of tech learning for students. Uh, do we have any people teaching younger students in here? Low age groups. Have you guys used sock puppets before? Okay. Sock puppets, what this does is this is a video app that allows you to animate little sock puppets 
with your voice. And so what happens is you pick the scene, you pick the characters, you hit record, and it records the sock puppets talking. And then it digitally changes the voice. So if you have an English language learner that's afraid of talking on video or afraid of being on camera, what happens is, is now they can do reader's theater or work through some kind of play or design a play or write a play or do some other kind of academic task and then the culminating project would be to turn it into a video and the characters in the video act out the scene but it's not really them, right? They get to hide behind this avatar of themselves and it's not really their voices because their voices have been digitally altered. And so the kids have a blast putting together this content. But on the front end of this, again, they can read Leaders Readers Theater. You can actually learn parts. People can learn lines. They can learn language and learn how to act things out and do a lot more with language leading up to the app. It's not the app. It's the... You with me? All right. Any, we doing okay? It's a litmus, litmus test. All right. How many of you have used Color Alive? This is an augmented reality app. I did it earlier with Jennifer. I don't know if you can see this on the screen, and I'd be happy to show you this afterwards. Um, but basically, this is another way of using video. The Crayola company has started selling these little books. And these books have pictures. This picture happens to be a picture of a dragon. Do you see this? Now what students do in classrooms is they color the dragon and whatever color they want to color the dragon, they bring it to life. They have to give the dragon a name, yes? Give it a name, give me that dragon's backstory. Where's the dragon from? What kind of life does it have? What is it doing? They're writing, they're doing language tasks, yes? But then when it's time, they can use the app to actually bring the dragon to life. And what happens in augmented reality, and Jennifer, you were holding the dragon earlier. Was he heavy? I can't remember. He wasn't that heavy, but what happens is, is the dragon actually comes to life in their hands and does little actions. It's augmented reality, and, and since they created the character, now they've got a picture of themselves or video of themselves with that character that they can then go home and show mom and dad or do different things, and now they've got something to talk about. So now they were writing, they were telling stories, they're going to go home and tell stories, and so that's, it's like viral learning. It's going to go out, and they're going to want to tell everybody. A lot of kids in school, what did you do today? Well, nothing, right? And... Now, this is a way to change that. They're going to want to go home and share this with everybody they can get their hands on. This is a tool for augmented reality. How are we doing on time? Am I doing okay? All right. I want to get through a couple of other things uh, real quick. Green screening. Any of you fans of that? One of my favorites of green screen. You guys have no idea what I'm talking about. What is that? It's a green screen. How much do you think it costs? With a coupon, 50% off at Joe and Fabrics, I think it was $3. I went and got the most hideous, obscene, green piece of cloth I could find. That means I could turn my classroom anywhere, anytime, into anywhere, anytime. Now, earlier today, um, I was here, you can see, see the T-Soul sign, right? I did the same thing, I just posted it here. She wanted to go to Brazil, some kind of uh, waterfall in Brazil, and so within one click, I was able to take her there because there are apps on all of our smartphones that allow us to green screen in our classrooms with students. Better yet, they allow our students to green screen, which means we can go anywhere in the world, right? How many of you are familiar with Google Maps? Yes? Okay, good. How many of you are familiar with Google Street View? Who has no idea what Google Street View is? Okay. In Google Street View, you can just click a place, right? And go there. Um, and so what's kind of fun is, like for example, um, you might decide that you're doing, you're reading Bram Stoker with your students, some kind of fictional novel, right? And you want to take them to Dracula's castle. So you type in Dracula's castle, right? And where is it? Romania? Okay, well now we're inside of Dracula's castle in Romania. And there's Vlad Tepest right there. And you can see this room, this 360 representation, right? We're in a 360 representation. We are inside of Dracula's castle through Street View. We can see it. We can be anywhere in the world. Now we can take a picture of that, put that behind the green screen, and now any of your students can do a live report, again, on whatever they're researching, from anywhere in the world. These are videos, but it's not the green screen app. 
it's not just to be able to record the video, it's how are you going to apply it in a way that engages students. And so again, it's not the app, it's the, you with me? Okay. So last thing I had here, where's my, uh... now these apps, if you're interested, um, I have a blog that I have, it's, a teacher, it's called Teacher Tricks, and on the blog you're, is where I've actually got this particular presentation today with everything I'm showing you here. But if you're interested in these apps, you can go here and just click on the links and download them and install them. They're, they're easy. Uh, one or two of them may have a dollar charge, but I think they're free for the most part. Um, the only other thing I'd recommend you try to do is a mashups. How many, where are my mashup fans? Who doesn't know any what a mashup is? Okay, yet. Yeah. Mashup is essentially taking any medium, like a, like a song or a video or whatever, and putting it together with another medium, song or video. So right now I'm doing, I'm just talking but well, we're recording this, so that's a video. Um, what's happening on my screen is also being recorded. That's a screencast. Do any of you screencast? Who does not know what screencasting is? Okay, let me show you that real quick. This video teaches you how to screencast, but I wanna demonstrate it for you real quick. Um, see this little button up in the top right-hand corner of my screen? That is a screencast button. If I say record desktop, it's gonna ask me do I wanna record my desktop and then it's gonna count down for me and basically allow me to record anything that's happening on this screen. Does that make sense? A screencast is a video. Well, I hadn't set it up yet. A screencast, I gotta, I'm sorry, I should have set that up before I started. I switched laptops this uh, last week. Um, a screencast is a tool that lets you just simply record everything that's happening on your screen and with one click it becomes a video that you can send to YouTube. Now. That means if you have PowerPoint slides or presentation slides, you could actually have video of yourself. Wait, do I hold it this way or this way? Which way? This way, right? So I hold the camera this way, I record myself talking, and then I can cut to a video screencasted presentation of content I want to show, and then I can cut back to students doing something else, and you can mash all those videos together, and that's what I mean by doing a mashup. Yes? And so what you're doing is you say, okay, well maybe, maybe we want to go to Google Earth and find a place on the planet and have people do a research project and video record them in that place using a green screen and then mash that up with a PowerPoint presentation of that. Students can do this, you can do this. It's a small world and smart mobile devices are making that happen. Uh, thank you for listening. You guys got any questions? Yes? Uh, Teachertricks.org. Yep, it's just teachertricks.org. You can go right there, and I think the, the right now the top, the, the presentation on top today is right there. And so just teachertricks.org, and that's the presentation I did today. Uh, when I present, my blog's always my outsourced memory, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a screencasting app suggestion for mobile screencasting? Uh, mobile screencasting is a little trickier. Yeah. Okay, right now mobile screencasting, I, I don't, <laughs> Um, I would recommend using, if you want to record what's happening on your mobile device, I'd recommend something called, um, uh, blanking on it, Reflector 3 is the latest version of it. There's also Reflector Teacher, which allows you to allow all your students. Now the trick there is you have to have good Wi-Fi. I was trying to use Reflector today, but it's not liking this space right here, and my two devices aren't, aren't communicating very well. And so you have to be on the same Wi-Fi network. But what it does is it lets you push a device and so you can you could kind of see me doing that when I tried that. It was uh, I'll try one more time. But again, what, this is Reflector 2. It's an old version of Reflector. And you see how I have my screen up there. And if the Wi-Fi was working, I'd be able to interact with this and just record right from that. Um, actual software to record from the device right now is not okay. Is it back? Is it there? It's still not there. It's there, but it's not. It's not interactive. Otherwise, I'd be happy to show you the green screen and the, and the other stuff, the other apps. Since it's not working, I wasn't able to show you stuff live. But basically, I can show you on my computer and I can show you how to do it. But this allows you to record uh, anything. Chromebooks, iPads, Android devices, it, you can push them all to other computers. And I think the app is like 14 bucks, but it allows you to record any other device on a screencasted tool. Other questions? Have to wait, please. I'll, I'm bringing you the mic. It's for the webcasting. We can't hear you on the webcast if you don't use the mic. Oh, yeah. I, I was. I didn't see what you used the green screen for. Okay, the green screen is actually used to record. 
Um, green, I can't come out, I can't come out. What's happening here is, you have to talk into the mic. All right, and if you want to turn that towards me right now, that might be able to see me as well, if it can. Um, if you guys notice right now, my phone is, is, the camera is on, yes? Right? Now, what green screen does is, the reason we use green and blue screen in video making is because human bodies don't have green and blue in them that much, right? If you do, you need to go see a doctor because your body's not supposed to be green or blue. But basically, when you point your device at green. You see how all of a sudden the green area became those waterfalls, right? Can you stand, can you hold that up for a second and have somebody stand up? I'm sorry, it fell down while I was doing you. But uh, can you see the green, where the green is, where he is? I don't know if you can see where they are. Do you see where they are? And they're kind of standing, and what it does is it keeps them there, but it changes the background to whatever I want the background to be. And that's what a green screen app does. I don't know if you can see that over there, but basically I'd be happy to show you after. A green screen app basically allows you to place, it's fine, don't worry about it, I'll show them later. But a green screen app allows them to, to replace any background with any other background. And you can do that in any classroom, anywhere, and it's really cheap and easy to do. For six bucks, you can have an entire green screen studio, app installed, green screen, ready to go, and take students anywhere in the world, which means, but of course, Make them do the research first. You have to learn about it. You've got to teach me things. And then once you've taught me things and learned some vocabulary, well, then we're going to go on a trip as a reward or something like that. And you'd be surprised how hard students will work to virtually go anywhere in the world. It's kind of a neat thing. And again, it's not about the app. It's about how you're going to apply that app. I'll, I'll take questions afterwards if you're interested. Um, in other words, Tony's got some stuff to, to, to show. That's for Tony. Do you want me to forward your slides or do you want to do you good? You got it. <laughs> All right. Um, if you weren't here at the beginning of the session, uh, my name's Tony Urban, I'm Chair of Education, also um, uh, Director of ESOL Endorsement at the University of Tampa. So uh, my th goal or thrust always is to think about the how. How do I get my pre-service teachers to think about pedagogically sound ways to apply these types of technologies? Um, and one of the things, and while we do a whole range, we work with a whole range of different technologies, especially Web 2.0 tools and free ones at that. Um, for you, I wanted to like just walk you through what we do with virtual and augmented reality, special, especially augmented reality. So I'm going to talk to you in the next 20 minutes about how I teach my pre-service teachers to actually learn the technology, but then think about the how. How do they go into a, a school where they are carrying out their prac with ESOL kids and to develop activities that are, uh, have a high learning impact? So just so we're on, this, on the same page, um, augmented reality is basically where you superimpose um, some type of image or video on something else, all right? Uh, the two types of uh, programs that I use with augmented reality is HP Reveal, they just bought out Erasma, I don't know, you might have heard of Erasma, um, and Metaverse. Um, and I'll go more into that in a, in a minute. So, but basically, uh, when I talk about triggers, say if I create a picture, I can use HP Reveal and then superimpose uh, a video on top of it. So then it's like a QR code. So when I, when I go across it with my camera, uh, a video comes up. And then the question is, how do, my, how do I use it as a teacher to uh, get my, my, the ELLs they teach in a classroom to learn English? The other thing is virtual reality, um, and there's different types of virtual reality. Uh, sometimes 
on one end of the spectrum, there's things like Second Life, you might have heard about it, where you actually create a world. Um, other things uh, on the other side of the spectrum is like Google Expedition, where you have these masks and you choose sort of like uh, be there in the environment and it sort of gives you sort of like a, a 360 degree view of a of a different uh, type of environment and ThingLink uh, used to have still Im images but now they have the same thing and you can do it on your computer or on um, uh, an iPhone. Um, let's see if it works. My sound doesn't work. But this is just like a, a classroom there on the right that they went to go visit the beach um, and they're looking basically at a, um, the Google Cardboards for the very first time. Um, so, but my interest is, of course, all of this has a novelty value and I want to move past the novelty value um, so, such that they become uh, these rich learning experiences. Well, just to give you an idea of, of uh, what I do is I have an ESOL uh, methods course and at the same semester my pre-service teachers, these are all elementary school teachers, do their um, methods course. They have to go into schools for 10 weeks and in Tampa most of our schools have up to 80% ELL population, high Hispanic population primarily. Um, so they will encounter students that have no English proficiency to their functioning with their uh, English. So the biggest question is, how do I teach uh, my beginning, my students with no English proficiency? So we, the technology is a big tool to sort of like help them develop materials to get their ELLs to talk and learn about English. So that's the context. So we have methods course, they go into prac, and what I get them to do is try out these technologies in their prep. So, thing is, what I've discovered over the years is while I have these 20 somethings in my methods class, they're not necessarily digital natives. Uh, yes, they might know Facebook, yes, they might be good on YouTube, but with any other type of introduction of technology, they say, uh, what, how, how do I do it? And you really have to take baby steps with them. Uh, so my pre-service teachers, when they go into school, it's not just the technology they need to think about, they need to think about everything from classroom management to their own lesson planning to uh, developing the material. So there's a whole bunch of things, aside from just the technology, learning how the technology works, that they have to so like bring together to make their teaching effective. When they're teaching the, the ELLs in the classroom, of course, the ELLs are concerned with their language, and trying to figure out the technology as well. The other thing is I can't usually rely on uh, the classroom teacher because often the classroom teacher is just uh, in their infancy in learning this type of technology as well. So whatever they get, uh, they have to get from me. So I've created, uh, basically my students they learn the technology through doing the technology. Um, and if you've seen this type of uh, uh, graph of, uh, before, it's not just about how to use the technology, but how to use it instructionally well. All right, so what do we do? So what I've done is develop this heuristic. And the heuristic is basically a a continuum of how they can think about uh, virtual and augmented reality. So you can see on the one side, uh, you can use augmented reality to help you manage your instruction. So that's sort of like low level type of stuff. So you can use something like, uh, like Google, a Google Drive to store all your images because ultimately you need images or videos to, uh, to match onto each other to create this augmented reality stuff. If, as you go on, you're giving increasing control. You're using the technology for different reasons. So um, you can use it to help you prepare instruction. Then you can move on to use the technology to present your instruction. Um, and then as you move on, you can create 
uh, guided practice activities, independent practice activities, and move on where you actually use the technology to build new things. So ultimately, uh, what I found effective for my pre-service teachers is learning through doing. And that's the best way they actually learn about the technology and then think about the technology uh, in pedagogically effective ways. So you can see here, um, what you see in the images here is um, some examples of, oh, maybe, I, well, I didn't say, the virtual reality stuff that I use is called patches or, uh, um, or Thinglink 360. All right, so that's the virtual reality. So here, here what you see is the image in the lower left-hand corner, uh, this is a student teacher using uh, patches, which uses uh, blocks. They call them blocks, and then you create uh, uh, worlds, or you can create um, uh, reality figures that come to life and, and, and whatnot. So it's a different, uh, up the top you've got uh, Erasma, where you have uh, create images and then vid videos come over it when you go with a uh, camera. And you can see here down the lower right, uh, elementary students using the same things. So in this PRAC, uh, what I do is uh, each week my students have to build and create um, augmented reality materials. So they start off in week one by collecting video samples and image, still image samples and they put them in Google Docs because with that, you know, you can then connect with a URL to basically anything. Then um, in week two, what they have to do is they start learning about different tools that will help uh, their students with anything from how to develop reading skills, listening skills, speaking skills. Um, and as you can see here, when it's about uh, reading, we use Read the Words because it's a, a, a program that you just upload text and then it reads in an electronic voice uh, what's on the text. Uh, we use uh, YouTube Go when we uh, deal with uh, video. And then we play around with Voki, which creates, you can create your own uh, avatar. Then by week three, they've collected these base resources and we start gluing them together or meshing them basically in the four types of augmented reality programs that I use. So HP Reveal, Metaverse, Patches, and Thinglink 360. So if you think about Thinglink 360, this is what it looks like. Oh, actually, I think I've got it up. Okay. So here, you can have a 360 type of world. In this, in this case, it's just a, a Chinese room. And then you can superimpose hotspots on it. And the hotspots can be anything from videos to images to audio. Um, so then it starts getting my pre-service teachers thinking about... Um, and the internet's a bit slow here, but it does come up quite quickly. You can start uh, having your teachers think about, well, how am I gonna use this? So what we do is we have them, oh. We have them start listening, uh, thinking about, well, if I want to have used something like uh, 360 ThingLink and have, and have their students, their ELLs, get better at reading, well, you need to scaffold the reading. So then they, my students start thinking about um, uh, creating uh, different types of reading levels and importing them into uh, Orasma or uh, metaverse and uh, then uh, around the classroom you have different types of triggers 
and each trigger has a different level of whether it's a listening activity or a reading activity, and then have to do things with them. So you can see here, this is just a few uh, things that my students came up with, my pre-service teachers. They create um, by week five and six, listening for gist activities, activities where they're listening at, for specific information. Um, if I go down to here, a bit slow. Let me make that a bit bigger. These are the types of things they come up with. So they have a, a text. Within the text there are um, vocabulary they want their ELLs to learn. Uh, associated with the text are various images. Then they start uh, mapping out well how they want to use the images. So they plant the images around the classroom. And say, for example, the first image that students would click on, it gives them pre-reading type of activity. That a Vocky comes up, they're listening, it orientates the learner to the text. The next image is again of a Vocky. They're listening to video, which gives background information on this particular text, which is about American Indians. Um, and then they fill out a KWL chart. Um, the next one is the buffalo one. Uh, there's a, a video of, some, of someone in the classroom reading something or saying something. Uh, and then, it, you, of course, you've got all the links. So this is something that they uh, uh, come up with to address. Well, how can I just use this, not just as a one-off, but it is scaffolded and, it, and it's ongoing in terms of building up, whether it's reading skills or listening skills, um, and as you can see, everything is, is located uh, and linked to something that's in their Google Drive. Oh. Sorry about that. couple of other things I want to show you. Okay, so again you can see some of the types of activities by week uh, 9, 10, and 11, 12 that the pre-service teachers come up with. Uh, you can see here they come up with uh, information gap activities, they use um, uh, Erasma or HP Reveal in jigsaw types of activities, um, and then James had alluded to differentiation, but uh, we also use uh, metaverse and the various augmented realities to promote uh, tiering and anchoring, uh, and it's a good thing to uh, use with flexible grouping and centers. Uh, let me... The PowerPoint's up there, if you click, I'll go out of the PowerPoint again, but each of these sort of like uh, are examples of students, pre-service teachers using these various tools for scavenger hunters, orienteering, role plays, picture difference, tasks, etc. cetera. Um, he, here's just an example. Once my pre-service teachers get used to uh, thinking about how they will use it, the tools, then uh, they get their students, their elementary students using the tools. So um, the important thing with the heuristic up the top is making the teachers comfortable with developing the tools and then getting their students to uh, start building the tools and using the tools. And here's just some uh, examples of uh, the students using them. Uh, this one was uh, the images below is an example of how um, this, these third graders were learning about uh, the cycles of the moon. They did it with Oreo cookies um, and they labeled them, but then they built out uh, the labels and the Oreo cookies became the triggers 
and then they video themselves using uh, the teacher's iPhone to explain it, and then they meshed it together. So again, it's uh, not just the pre-service teachers learning about how to implement the tools, but getting the students to use them in realistic ways. Moving on the other side, you've got um, uh, Thinglink 360 being used for big books because one of the things with a kindergarten, a first grader that's pre-literate, um, a lot of the, it's, the question is, how do you get them to use this technology when uh, their cognitive le level is, is uh, the developmental level is so much lower? Um, so this is an example of, a, of some of my pre-service teachers putting hotspots on images in um, big books and, and this was on a, a story about cabi uh, pumpkin patches uh, and then recording themselves and talking about the book uh, while listening to the book. Uh, this one was, the last one is using Metaverse. Um, again, that's one of those uh, uh, augmented reality type of tools. You can do both virtual and augmented with Metaverse, but it's like you cr cr create um, uh, like a moving avatars like the dragon, um, and that's what that, that teacher did with their students. You can see they're sitting on a map of the United States and they created their little uh, uh, avatars to talk about elements from each state. Um, and those kids were in first grade uh, and then once they saw the teacher do it, then they did it and created things uh, with, uh, with Metaverse. So again, that's all I just really wanted to explain to you guys, um, that the how is a very important thing. It's not a matter of just saying, go and use it, because that never happens. Um, it's about training the te your t teachers to how to use the technology uh, in the classroom. Questions? Easy. I'm sorry, I, I'm a little baffled about the metaverse. Are you talking about actual 3D images that jump up and... Yeah. And but what, it's within the program. You don't create them per se, you choose but, them. But you're seeing this like a hologram or that's jumping up? No, it's not, a, it's not a hologram per se. It's within the program, so you can choose these characters and then they move. But they're on um, screen, just on and, screen? Uh, right, and, and with... with um, have you ever seen Pokemon Go? Uh, where you you see these little uh, character, you you point the, your 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 phone at something, and then within that realistic environment, the character comes up. So the nice thing with metaverse, it's locational. So you can use it, you can use a still image to trigger the character coming up, or you can uh, set it such that you use uh, uh, latitude and longitude. At, that will only come up if you're near the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and then it comes up, but it doesn't just come up, it comes up and says or does whatever you want. So if you could, most, I've seen it used a lot with scavenger hunts. Um, so then when you go there, it says, you need to do this, you need to read this, uh, and then go find the next one. Um, and there was a video there of my students actually using it at my university and to learn about how to use Metaverse. Great. So that's how that's used. Good. Gentleman over there? No? I just uh, heard you mention scavenger hunts. Do you have an idea on how to present that in this How area? to present it? How would you use this in, in uh... Well, um, the, the, what I get my, say when I'm working with my pre-service teachers, I say the whole idea is to, well, are you, the one time I use the scavenger hunt in my class is when they're learning about uh, reading, right? So, uh, you know, there's a process to reading and, uh, and working on text and uh, first doing pre-reading activities and then 
thinking about the language in the text and the vocabulary in the text and then uh, you build context with the, with the, on the text that you're dealing with and then you move on to do other things, you do during reading activities and whatnot. So when I use that process with the scavenger hunt, they, first of all, they, they go to the first place they have to get to and it's learning about the context like a pre-reading activity of whatever the text is about. So they might be looking at video, they might be uh, uh, look, listening to me say something about the content of the text, and they go to the next place. Um, and then it's maybe they're learning about the vocab that I know is situated in the text, or they, they're learning about some language structure that I want them to learn that's in, in the text, and that's at the next place, and then so on, so on. So it's like doing in the scavenger, each stage of the scavenger hunt, uh, pre-reading, during reading, after reading activities. So th you're talking about uh, uh, hard copies, not, not electronic devices where they go to, from electronic device to electronic device, you're talking about... No, they use their phones to find all these places. So it, it's so what I do is the triggers, say if I'm using um, uh, HP Reveal or Erasma, all right? So that's where you, an image becomes a trigger and then when you go over your phone with it, something crops up, right? So the, the whole scavenger hunt is they have to find the images, the triggers. But at each trigger, they see and do something differently. But the whole thing, the seeing and the doing of what they're doing is learning about reading process or writing process or listening process. So would you use like QR codes to... No, images, images, images. Images, um, images that are related to the text, right? So if like... So this one here, um, you can see here, this was a text. It was a text about Native American Indians. And these are all images related to the text. So I use this, the green part, as my scaffold. So they do pre-exploration of the text. Then they in, help to interpret, do an ex interpretive exploration where they're learning about the words in the text and whatnot. So these, these are my pre-service teachers. So they're right, learning about reading process, right? Then they go everything. So it's like a pre, during, after. But the whole scavenger hunt is each image, they have to do something different, and they see something different. So they're learning about reading process through doing the scavenger hunt. Um, so then they, fig they learn about how you can use this technology with their kids. So then what, what my pre-service teachers do, they go, they do it themselves, and then they do it with their elementary kids when they're in their prac, all right? And then I always want to get them to the stage where they're then cr not just creating their scavenger, augmented reality scavenger hunts, but they're doing it then together with their students. They're creating other ones. So they create it to deliver and then they create it to do with their students. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for any of the other panelists? Yes, okay, I'll be right there. And whoever he wants to ask the question, you guys have to stand up and go to the microphone. Okay, uh, my, my question goes to Susie. Okay, and uh, I, I would like to know uh, when you talk about uh, the, the use of video, of course, it's quite interesting. Uh, but you realize, like where I, I come from, I, I, maybe some of the teachers may not be skilled in, uh, okay, videography. Uh, at the same time, uh, I don't know whether one requires to, to be familiar with storyboarding uh, and do you have a, like, is there a place or a tutorial where someone can come up with a script? Because I want to believe uh, whatever you are presenting uh, must be supported by uh, a well-written script, isn't it? 
and maybe that will also apply to what the second presenter uh, showed us. So how would you advise us? Because not all teachers have the, the skills to create videos. So is there a site, is there a tutorial, or what is your suggestion? Oh, that's a great question because I am actually the chair for an IS that will no longer exist um, called Vid Video and Digital Media Intersection. However, we are now going to be in the form of Video PLN. There's a little info uh, postcard up here for you guys to take. But that's really what we talk about all the time. Uh, one of the sessions that our, our past chair and some of our other members just did was all the multiple hats that these instructors need to have on in order to create videos like that. And again, I don't come from a video background originally. I just ended up in that role because I happen to know the software the best and have some graphic design skills. Um, and I had to transition into a videographer from a regular IEP teacher, and that's completely changed my career. But it is something that's possible um, on a low budget, without a lot of skills, um, but the videos that I mentioned earlier are really specific for uh, MOOC design or for uh, courses that you're going to have on a very asynchronous level uh, where there is very little contact with the teacher. But even for a blended learning situation or a flip situation, um, you can do low budget, more homemade style videos but still be very effective. And that's the conversation that uh, the video PLN has on a regular basis. We even have um, a playlist in the TESOL YouTube channel. So if you go to the TESOL YouTube channel um, and you look for VDMIS or Video and Digital Media, um, we have a playlist there where a lot of the previous members have created how-to videos um, on either lighting or uh, taking the video or choosing the camera, choosing the right camera, choosing the right um, equipment such as mic and other things like that. So it, it, there's some learning that happens and definitely a learning curve that every instructor will have to go through, but it is possible. Um, we are all homemade video people. We just learned it ourselves and figured it out ourselves. Um, and, and again, our videos may not look as polished, but because we are the specialists in the area, we feel that if you are the one teaching the content, creating the content, you should really be involved in the video creation just to make it more effective. So please check it out and please take one of these and join our group. Did you want Are there to say any more questions? Jennifer? Jennifer, did you want to say something? Oh, I was just asking you to pull up the TESOL YouTube channel that Susie was talking about since we have the screen and there was nothing on it, but. Uh, what is the, it's, I think uh, it's youtube.com and then slash TESOL Inc. We have some more questions. INC? Yeah. Yeah, then if you go to, so here if you go to playlists, um, you will see, oh here, video and digital media intersection. And we have a bunch of how-to videos already there. Oh, sorry. So this is the one that I created a while back about um, really quick online video editing software that you could easily use. But we have all sorts of other things on video editing. Um, we have uh, video setups. And this is a video of different instructors showing what they use when they create videos. So um, like the green screen that James introduced, like a lot of these people have green screens just kind of hanging in their offices you know, you turn your office into an immediate studio right away on a really low budget. And so all of that is possible. So please check out this playlist. We are going to have a new playlist under the video PLN name. Um, we may be able to transfer some of this over, but this is still going to remain there for you. So definitely check those videos out. But again, if you have specific questions, um, you know, join our group, at, um, c join the conversation, and we will have a lot of professionals ready to answer a lot of those questions. Any other questions for any of the other panelists as well? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. I know this was a long session, but I hope you really gained a lot out of it. Thank you so much.